Hello, and welcome to USCAD's monthly webinar series. This is the January 2015 edition, and today's presentation is called Supersize Me, Managing Large-Scale Models. This is the first of a three-part series dealing with large-scale projects in the world of BIM. Today, we're going to be talking about hardware and its impact on performance. And then in February, we'll be talking about work sets and links. And then in March, we'll talk about groups and families. All three of these presentations are geared specifically around working on large projects in the BIM world. Before we get started in the actual presentation, I wanted to take a few moments and give you a little bit of information on my background. That way you have a better idea of who is speaking to you today. First off, I'm the Senior Director of Professional Services for USCAD. And what that really means is I set the direction for both current and future service offerings for USCAD, and I also manage the group of professionals that actually deliver those services to our actual clients. I'm also the owner of an online group or online community, more likely, that is called Club Revit, and that is in two different places. Clubrevit.com is actually a blog posting site where you'll see posts about blogs all around the world of Club, uh, Revit. And then also a LinkedIn group called Club Revit as well. And on the LinkedIn group is where we manage our membership. And you'll find that we have 17,900 plus members. And that group is really about being able to post all sorts of information related to the world of BIM. And you'll see people from around the world commenting and posting and making discussions about their experiences working with Revit and other BIM related technologies. So I encourage everybody, if you're not already a member of Club Revit on LinkedIn, the LinkedIn group, um, please go out and join and uh, become part of the group. And you'll find that there's lots of ways you can get information. People are more than happy to help you. And there are also places where you can provide information with questions that maybe you have experience in. Now for today's presentation, the part of my background that probably applies the most is when I was working for a company called Freed Butter Group in Las Vegas, Nevada. Now while I was there, I was the Revit Task Force Manager. And my job was to make sure that Revit was successfully working on many of their large-scale projects. You may not know the name Friedmutter Group well if you haven't worked in the casino space, but if you've worked in the casino space, then you probably have seen their name. Um, that's all the, all the work that they do is casino design or hospitality with a casino mix. So very, very popular group inside of that space, not so well known outside of that space. But they do lots of very, very large projects and very, very fast-paced projects. Um, which both were very interesting to experience and are a big part of what today's presentation is really all about. And I even started this particular presentation, presentation series at Autodesk University back in 2008 when I was actually working at Friedmutter Group. Today's agenda is pretty simple. We're going to first define what a large project is. Then we're going to talk about the network and how the BIM data works on your network. We're going to look at different hardwares to pay attention to. We're going to talk about something I call the Holy Trinity. Then we're going to talk about infrastructure, server needs, and then talk about RAM, which is always the uh, confusing part of hardware when it comes to Revit and BIM-related technology. And then we're also going to talk about how do we know this? So how do we get to these conclusions, and how do we understand how Revit and how hardware works so well together? And uh, give you a little bit of background on that. But before we get started, I wanted to make a couple of quick comments. I know a lot of you are going to be BIM users and you really just want to get into understanding Revit and Navisworks and other software, but the hardware part of the discussion is extremely important, especially if you're working on large-scale projects. Um, large-scale projects are their own unique animals and you really have to make sure that the hardware portion of the equation is already solved long before you get into the actual working of the project because when you're on hard, or large projects, Hardware can be the difference between being able to open a file and not being able to open a file. So it's extraordinarily important that you understand hardware. And that's the reason why this is the first in a three-part series around managing large-scale projects. Now to get started today, the first thing I want to do is actually define what a large project is. And this is a very important to this presentation because I started doing this presentation at AU many years back and almost every year that I do it at AU, I have a number of people that come up to me afterwards and say, man, I really like some of the things you showed, but if I tried to do that on my project, it just seems like it would be overkill. And then when I get done talking to them and I ask them about what projects they work on, um, they're working on single family homes and doing very small projects. And that's absolutely the case. So when we're talking about the things we're going to be discussing in this particular presentation, we're really talking about large projects. 
applying some of these techniques and ideas to smaller projects isn't going to make those projects run poorly. Um, it's just probably overkill and not necessary for those types of projects. So the very first part of this presentation is really about defining what a large project is so that we're all on the same page. So on 2008, when I first did this presentation, I had this particular slide, and it was basically to help me define what a large project was. So at that time, we were defining large projects as 300 million to 12 billion in construction dollars, 3 million to 25 million in square feet, multi-use projects that include casinos and nightclubs and spas and pools and restaurants and retail and hotel and condos and even conference centers. Now, when we did this particular presentation, you know, 12 billion seemed like the most we would ever do. Um, but I have to say, just a few weeks after this presentation that we did in 2008, we started working on a project that was around 18 to 20 billion dollars in construction dollars. So um, it's really kind of changed the perspective but it still kind of fit into the classification of a very large project. Now, while I was at Friedmutter Group, probably the project that I gained the majority of my knowledge on how to deal with large projects with BIM was a project called the Cosmopolitan Casino Resort. It's on the Las Vegas Strip. It's 6.7 million square feet, sits on 8.6 acres. So the math on that, if you look at it, it's the most dense project, basically this side of the Mississippi you know, in the United States, it's extremely dense to where there's very, very tight information. It's got 3,000 hotel rooms, 90,000 square foot casino, 170,000 square foot of restaurants and retail, 165,000 square feet of conference space, um, 150,000 square foot pool and deck, and 27,000 square foot of nightclub, uh, 40,000 square foot spa, 3,600 parking spaces, which that's part is one of the unique elements of the Cosmopolitan, that those parking spaces are all underground in Vegas, so that's unusual. And it's about a 3.6 to $3.8 billion project as far as the budget was concerned. But it's a mega project, and it was all done, or I shouldn't say all, I should say the architecture and the interiors were all done in Revit. And since we didn't have any consultants at the time that were using Revit, we also reproduced the structure and a large amount of the actual HVAC um, for our model so we could do clashing against it um, back in those days. So it really constitutes what a mega project really is all about and really gets to the level of how do I deal with a project that's that size, that has that much information and deal with it inside of a Revit or a Navisworks or many of the other BIM related technologies. And that's what we're really here to talk about today. How do we do that specifically around hardware? Now, Looking at hardware, you really ought to start off and understand how does the data on your network flow before we get into specific discussions about hardware. Because once you understand how the data flows, then you get a much better good, a much better idea on the hardware you're going to need to support how that data flows. So this first diagram is a really quick, easy reference, and hopefully you've all seen it before, about how Revit specifically works with its central files and then the local files with each team member. So as you can see in the middle at the top here, we've got a central file that's located typically on a file server um, somewhere on your network. And then whenever a user goes to access that file, what Revit does is actually makes a local copy on that user's workstation. And then whenever that user is editing it, it's actually continuously communicating um, back to the central file. So I created a real quick little demonstration here to talk about how the data is working. So that central file disperses to each one of the local files, and then it's continuously communicating back and forth to that central file to that local file. So every time that somebody clicks on an object, it does what's called element borrowing, and it communicates that borrow back to the central file so that nobody else can actually check out that particular item. And this makes it ability for multiple people to work on the same file at the same time, which is a really great functionality of Revit, but at the same time, it also proposes some interesting dilemmas for us as far as hardware is concerned. Um, probably the most important thing to understand is at the file server where the central file is going to be at, um, you actually have to have data storage there that can handle both very large data pieces of data and very small pieces of data and able to do that on a very rapid, uh, rep very rapid pace. And we'll talk about that a little bit later when we talk about file servers. But also the, between the file server and the local user, it really becomes important too because it's continuously communicating back and forth. And this is kind of a key difference between 
working in the world of a product like Revit or a BIM-related technology, and then working with something like AutoCAD in the past, where AutoCAD really didn't have a whole lot of network traffic. You made the file, file, you actually accessed it on the network, typically, and there wasn't a whole lot of data transfer back and forth, so it didn't require a lot of communication, which didn't require a lot of bandwidth and that sort of thing. So understanding how this works is really key and very important to actually how you support or how the hardware you put into place supports the actual BIM project. So this so is a very simple example. This is really based on Revit, um, but there's a number of different BIM type technologies that use a very similar concept. So when we start talking about hardware that you need to be concerned about, um, these are the things that we're really talking about. We're talking about local hardware. What kind of workstation does the user have? How does it perform? What does it do? We're also talking about network infrastructure. So we're talking about wires and um, switches and things of that nature. And then we're also talking about servers um, where file servers all of a sudden become extremely important um, that they have very fast read and write capabilities so it doesn't slow down the project. And then last but not least is bandwidth. So not only bandwidth um, from the user to the servers, but when you start communicating with your external or your extended design team, so your other engineers, architects, and contractors, you also need to be able to support very large files going in and out of your office on a continuous basis. And that can also become a major thing to be concerned about as you work and work, move into the world of BIM as it relates to large projects. Now, to start with, we're going to talk a little bit about local hardware. And I've coined this phrase, and I hope it doesn't have any bad connotations. I got it from a food environment, but the holy trinity um, that's actually you know, around Cajun food, about how you start the base of a lot of Cajun food. But it's basically three items that really make things go. And so I wanted to borrow from that when I'm talking about hardware and really talk about the three things on local hardware that have a massive impact on your BIM technology. What's going to make your BIM technology run the fastest? In this case, a lot of the discussion is going to be around Revit because we've done a lot of testing around Revit. Um, but we find that this applies to many, many, many other pieces of technology, um, everything from um, Navisworks uh, to other modeling, uh, BIM modeling technologies um, to animation and rendering technologies, all of those types of things. So the holy trinity to start with is really the combination of CPU, storage or um, hard drives, and then RAM. And what you really want to do is make sure you have a combination of these things that are super fast. So first off with your CPU, you want to have a 3.0 gigahertz or faster processor. And most of the systems that we're looking at today are have an i7 processor that's 3.0 or higher. Um, they go all the way up to like 4.0, 4.2 these days. So they definitely have a lot of, um, lot of speed. And then when you talk about storage, um, you're really talking about two different types of storage these days. There's um, what we call spindle drives, which are traditional hard drives. And then we have SSD drives, which are significantly faster. So we used to refer to um, spindle drives because SSDs either weren't available or were just too expensive. And so we took multiple spindle drives and we put them together with RAID 0 to make them fast. Well, now we can take SSD drives and even multiple SSD drives, RAID 0 them together, and they're even faster. So the increase of SSDs has really created a nice combination for really working on BIM projects in a very fast system. So SSDs are a highly recommended um, upgrade to any system you're going to be running any type of BIM technology on. And then last but not least is RAM. And there's going to be a specific conversation about RAM here in a few moments. But uh, the thing to remember here is actually it's not just about the amount of RAM, but it's also about the speed or the megahertz of RAM, the frequency in which it runs. The higher the frequency, the faster the RAM. So it's not just so much about whether I got 16 gigs or 32 gigs, but it's also about what speed is it running at. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, but you'll notice I have 1600 meg um, megahertz and also 2133 megahertz RAM listed, and uh, we'll explain some of those differences in a bit. But before I go too terribly far, I wanted to take the time and show you a tool that we actually use whenever we're looking at selecting specifically CPUs. So you'll notice at the bottom of my screen, I have a web link, um, www.cpubenchmark.net. Now I'm going to take you out to that particular website. So I'm going to minimize my presentation. And then I'm going to actually go to this. I just have an icon you know, set for this particular site. And you'll see it's uh, cpubenchmark.net. And we actually use this site a lot. Um, so when we're looking for CPUs and we're trying to decide what's the most cost-effective CPU 
for the particular environment that we're looking for, um, we actually use this site to really gauge what's the best or the most value proposition CPU. So if I come over here where it says high-end CPU chart and I click on that, it actually gives me a list of CPUs and a ranking for each one of them. Now this is super critical because you'll notice that the ranking you know, grows and then the CPUs get a little bit slower, a little bit slower, but understanding what this is really helps you make some determination. So for example, you might notice that this very top one, um, which is a Xeon processor at 2.3 gigahertz, you might wonder 2.3 gigahertz, why is that one so scoring so high? And um, if you click on that particular item, you'll see that the reason it scores so high is because it's got 18 cores. So that means there's 18 processing cores inside of that CPU. So all of those together um, create speed and uh, create a better performance, even though each individual core may not be operating at as high a level of speed as some others. So it's important to understand that about processors, specifically around the world of BIM, because a lot of technologies, including Revit, are not what we call multi-threaded. And uh, what that means is that they can't take advantage of all of the CPUs or all the cores that are available to them. Now Revit in particular is multi-threaded in certain facets of the technology. So certain areas of Revit are multi-threaded and certain areas are not. So investing heavily into a CPU that's got lots of cores um, probably isn't the best investment in trying to get Revit to run successfully or fast. So this very first processor, which is, I might add also $6,600, is probably not the best processor to choose for a Revit workstation. So when you wanna scroll down and start looking at items, and the ones that we typically look at are the i7 items, um, and suppose the Xeons, the Xeons tend to have quite a bit of higher price point to them. So this i7 here, the i7-4960X, is a 3.6 gigahertz processor. It's also about $1,000, scores fairly well in the 14,000s. If we come down in here and we start looking at some of these, you'll start seeing the pricing starting to look differently. So for example, this i7-5820K processor at 3.3 gigahertz is $379, which is a decent deal, and it scores well over the 10,000 mark, which is a kind of an important item, and it's operating at 3.3 gigahertz. So that particular processor might be a really good choice. And if you click on it and go to the stats of it, then you'll see that indeed it's got six cores, um, which isn't quite as insane as 18, and it operates at 3.3, so that's actually not a bad processor. And we'll be actually talking to this one a little bit later. But this is actually a tool that we use to really understand what processors are available, um, what their scoring is, and then what their price point is. But the scoring is also another unique thing that this technology, or this particular site does. Um, it actually gives you a, a tool or an app to download, and then it runs these tests on your local machine, and then it puts those results back up into the system so that you're not just seeing the results from one test that one company did, you're seeing the results from thousands of people doing the same test and then providing these results. So sites like this can help you in a great way of understanding what it is that you're looking at, but you also gotta understand the technology you're looking at to make sure that you're getting the right processor. A lot of people might come to here and just say, hey, I want the fastest thing that's on here with the highest score, and that would be a very poor choice for a BIM-related technology. Now, moving back to our presentation, I'm gonna um, close out this particular uh, site first and then relaunch my presentation. And when you start talking about these items, it really gets interesting because every particular item with your network or with your IT is gonna have an impact. So what we tried to do throughout this presentation is cover the basics in each area. Now, if you're an IT professional, you're gonna see some of this presentation and you're gonna say, well, they didn't really talk about this particular item or that particular item. And it's important to understand that we knew we were gonna have a very mixed um, set of attendees to this particular presentation. So I'm sure there's lots of IT professionals and then also lots of BIM professionals that don't have as much IT experience. So we wanted to kind of cover a high level um, piece of information and kind of some of the details that are super important. But it is important that you realize that if you have more questions around this technology or around the things we're talking about today, um, we're more than happy to answer those questions in complete detail. So if you look at something and you're thinking, hey, there should be more data, um, just let us know. We'll be happy to cover those questions for you. Um, the next particular area is infrastructure needs. And we're really talking about wiring and switches. And I don't wanna to go too terribly deep into this, but wiring is pretty straightforward. You need Cat5e or better, it needs to support gigabit or better, and it needs to be to the workstation. Um, you don't want to 
um, take the wire or one wire to a group of workstations and then distribute a group of workstations via a switch or a hub or something of that nature. It's a common mistake that we see on a regular basis. So you really want to have a Cat5e wire to the actual workstation itself and then all the way back into your system. So kind of expanding by the use of switches and things and stacking things is not such a great idea in this world. It will definitely slow down your performance overall with BIM. Um, the next thing is around switches. This is also an area where uh, the move from an AutoCAD-based environment into a BIM world really changes the need of switches. Used to, we could get away with a very minimum information or very minimum um, hardware in this arena, but now we really need to have a managed enterprise level switches. They need to be gigabit. Um, we recommend HP, Cisco, um, names of that nature. Uh, it's not a huge item as long as they're good managed systems. Now, one of the other challenges that we see, and this has been coming up a lot because um, voice over IP phones is, have really become very popular. And uh, one of the challenges that happens in this arena, because a lot of times there's only a single uh, network cable to the desk, and uh, then people take that network cable and they plug it into their phone, and then they plug a, a network cable from the phone into the actual workstation. And uh, that has proven to be very, very bad in the world of BIM. So plugging into a VoIP phone um, directly in your network, that uh, switch or hub, depending on what the phone itself has in it, um, will definitely slow down the network traffic and will cause your BIM environment to run much, much slower. Now, there are some particular VoIP phones out there that have a nice um, switch inside of them, but those tend to be the much more costly phones and the ones that people tend to do the least amount of buying. So if you're going to do something like that and you don't have any other alternative, look closely at the VoIP phone and make sure you understand exactly what the switching capabilities inside of that phone are um, before you try to plug a workstation into a VoIP phone and um, hoping that the throughput's going to be enough to handle a BIM environment. Um, we would definitely recommend against doing that. Now, the next area is around servers. And obviously, we could spend a you know, multi-hour presentation talking about servers. So we wanted to do a very high-level discussion about servers. And basically, we just created two different areas, processing power for a server and then also file storage for servers. And we basically gave a high-end and a low-end for each one of them. And not necessarily go into complete detail, but enough to give you a basic idea of what you're looking for. So processing power, again, for servers supporting BIM becomes extremely important because you've got a lot of data coming through the server and it's got to be able to process that data very rapidly. Lots of small pieces of information and then also huge, big chunks of information. So the processing power needs to be there. So on the high end, we're talking about dual Xeons, 3.0 gigahertz or higher, you know, 8 to 10 cores with very fast RAM um, in that environment. So we're talking about some significant processing power on the server level. On the low end, if you're trying to get a file server built and you don't want to break the bank, um, on the low end, an i7 or even a single Xeon with 3.4 gigahertz or faster and six cores with, uh, with fast RAM will get you by. Um, but as most of you know that have dealt with servers in the past, you know, that particular um, item may get you by for a period of time. But if you get a lot of projects on that or you got a large office, um, that probably isn't going to support your environment. So if you're a small to medium sized firm and you're just trying to get away with a server that you can put into place and is going to last for a couple of years. And then as you grow, you want to get into something bigger. That's kind of what that low end recommendation is about. Now on file storage, you really have to look at file storage closely. And this is a key area. File storage, again, used to be something that you didn't have to worry so much about on a server environment dealing with, with AutoCAD, but in the world of BIM, becomes extremely important. So on the high end, um, if we're talking about SANS, um, really we want to do fiber channel um, right to the processing system, to the actual file storage system. You want to have extremely fast disk and a large pool to share the spindles. And uh, the IOPS are what's super important here. Um, you need to have extremely fast IOP um, back and forth, reading and writing. And it also needs to be as clean as possible. So you don't want a lot of clutter in between your storage and your actual processing system. So it becomes extremely important that you put nice things in. Now, um, on the high end, there's a, a few different items out there that now have SSDs as the front end storage or temporary storage of active data and then spindle storage on the back end for less active data. Um, we've done some testing around that and we've seen some pretty good results. 
So those systems seem to be working fairly well. Um, but also the connection between that SAN or that other device, that storage device, and your processing unit again needs to be super fast. So fiber channel is what we recommend. On the low end, you can really go with direct attached storage inside of the actual processing unit. So fast disk with RAID 10 for performance and redundancy. Um, you can do spindles or you can do SSDs. SSDs are going to get you a much higher performance. The stigma around SSDs in a server environment is definitely dropping. People are starting to realize that the life expectancy issues around SSDs um, wasn't the critical thing that most people were led to believe at the beginning. So that's really not so much of an issue anymore. But SSDs are so much faster than spindles. Um, so you get a few SSDs in there and that's great. And then the price point of spindle drives and SSDs is really changed dramatically in the last year. So you can pick up SSDs for very close proximity pricing to actual their spindle neighbor, you know, spindle neighbors, neighbors. But you can still get spindles in a much higher um, storage capacity. So bigger storage in the spindle drives are still available where SSDs kind of have a limitation of how big they get. Um, but that, of course, will be changing as time goes on. So that's your processing um, server and your file st server or file storage server discussion. Now, the next area is around RAM, and this is easily the most confusing part of the discussion about hardware as it relates to BIM. And uh, we spend a lot of time <laughs> talking to clients about what does RAM mean, you know, what are the differences, and how does that apply. And um, this slide is something that we put together you know, a couple of different times, and it definitely changes each time we do this presentation. So um, hopefully we can kind of clear up some of the um, the muddiness around RAM. But the most common question that we get is, does RAM make Revit faster? That's probably the mo number one question that we get and whenever we're talking about hardware. And the challenge of that question is, we used to just be able to say no because there was nothing about RAM speed that really affected it. Um, but now we have to say yes and no. But um, really the question most people are, are asking is, if I put more RAM in my computer, and that means if I'm going from 8 gigs to 16 gigs, does it make Revit faster? And the answer to that, of course, is no. The amount of RAM doesn't make Revit faster. What it does do is allow you to actually work on larger projects um, within RAM, which as long as you're working within RAM, um, the machine will run fast. As soon as you run out of RAM is whenever the machine slows down. So the amount of RAM is really not an issue about speed, but an issue about how do we actually understand how much RAM do we need to support a file. And we're going to be talking about that in just a moment. But before I go to that, I want to answer the part of the question that is yes, um, which is RAM does come in multiple speeds now. And uh, a lot of times, it's always kind of been the case, but it really wasn't a really well-known item. And now it's becoming more prevalent. So most RAM these days comes in 1333, 1600, and 2133 um, speeds or megahertz or frequencies this is technically what they're called. Um, there's also an 1866 around the Xeon um, space. And this is the RAM, this is RAM speeds or RAM megahertz for more common base systems. There are other RAM megahertz for other different types of system. We'll be talking about some in a bit. Um, but these are the kind of the common ones for the systems that people are generally using today. So if you go to a Dell or an HP and you try to buy hardware from them, you're typically either going to get the 1600 megahertz or the 1333. Um, you typically won't see the 2133. Um, but 2133 um, RAM makes your system run significantly faster. Um, so being able to have a system that has 2133 um, is super critical. But there are some specific things you have to do with your CPU and your motherboard to be able to support this. Um, so when you start talking about 2133 RAM, you're talking about really tweaking your system to be able to run as fast as possible. And you want to make sure that you have a professional that really knows how to do this. Because by doing this, you can easily cause your CPU to overheat and cause damage to your CPU if you don't know how to do this properly. So if you're really looking for this 2133 RAM and you want to increase your speed by using that, uh, make sure you talk to somebody that's actually worked in this space. Essentially what you want to do is talk about, you know, how do I get an i7 processor to work with 2133 RAM, and uh, you'll be able to find stuff on the internet. You can also contact us directly. We've got tons of experience um, as US CAD building uh, machines around 2133, and we know most of the tweaks. But it's also important to know that your system that you have, the motherboard and CPU may not support this option. So 
even if you know how to do it, you may not be able to do it because of the CPU and motherboard that you might have in your computer. And also when you're buying a new computer, um, if you want to be able to do that, you need to make sure you're buying a system that has a specific CPU and a specific motherboard that can actually support that. And it's definitely hard to get those specifics from the major computer manufacturers. So like Dell and HP, you're really not going to find those guys that are going to really provide something at that level. Now there is one company out there called Box Technologies, so it's B-O-X-X -X Technologies, and they actually are very good at this particular arena, so they make very fast systems. Uh, the unfortunate thing about their systems is they also come with a very high price tag, um, so they tend to be very expensive, and uh, so that's kind of a hard one to understand. So moving away from the discussion about speed of RAM and getting back to the amount of RAM, this is probably one of the biggest critical items of dealing with large projects that you really got to know how to do. And um, I refer to it as the rule of 20, and I shouldn't say I because a lot of people in the industry do this, but the rule of 20 is super critical. If you take the size of your file, Revit file, so you say you have a Revit file that's 200 megs, and you want to know how much RAM is it going to take to support that 200 meg file, if you use the rule of 20, it actually will take that file size, multiply it by 20, and that will give you the amount of RAM it's going to take to load that particular project. And that will you know, be able to then say, okay, are all the people who are working on this project, do they have that much RAM on their system? And if they do, then you're in good shape. But the one thing to remember about the rule of 20 is it doesn't necessarily take into account other factors. So for example, the operating system on the machine takes up RAM. Um, if you have a, a program in the background running like Outlook, that takes up RAM. Um, if you're streaming some music at the same time, that takes up RAM. So you want to know what your base system RAM operation needs before you're running Revit, and then use the rule of 20 to determine the Revit information. Um, also, if you have other files attached to your Revit file, so if you're linked DWG files or you have another Revit file linked um, or if you have point clouds, all of those things have an impact on how much RAM is required to run that particular project. So with that in mind, a number of times we've created a spreadsheet or a document for a client to be able to calculate their own RAM size. And I was going to share kind of one of those with you, but I didn't want to share some of the company information, so I created a very generic version. So I'm going to exit out of the presentation here and take a look at that particular um, spreadsheet. So now that I've exited out of my presentation, I've got a uh, spreadsheet here. I call it the RAM calculator, and I first want to apologize for um, it's not being very uh, pretty. <laughs> um, normally I spend a little bit more time on my spreadsheets, but I just wanted to give you an idea of how you can develop a spreadsheet yourself. And I've also been asked by a number of folks to create a generic version of this RAM calculator for people to use for their internal, and I definitely will be doing that um, you know, for our client base. So um, we'll be able to develop a, a new version of this, and then we'll make it available to everybody, especially if you've attended this presentation. So the thing in here is just to have a really quick system. So over here, I have the Revit, um, Revit file size and megabytes. So if I have a 200 meg Revit file, I just type in 200 real quickly. It uses the rule of 20 calculator and it tells me that I need 4,000 megs or 4 gigs of RAM. And then it tells me my total over here. And then the other thing is nice to do is actually to also to establish other DWGs or Revit files that actually might be there. And you'll see the multiplier here changes. And this is a critical piece because the multiplier for the file that you're opening directly is 20, but the multiplier for the other files that are attached to that file or linked to that file are not necessarily the same. And the more confusing part is sometimes those adjust, and I'll explain some of that. But let's just say I have a, you know, an AutoCAD file that's 20 megs, and then I have another one that's 10, and then I wasn't paying attention one day and somebody put a big AutoCAD file that was 60. And uh, let's just say since we're dealing with a large project, I got another Revit file that's 120, and then one that's 400, and then you know one that's just say 300. And you'll notice that all of those things are adding up. In this particular calculator, my total RAM needed is, is growing. So I've got 6.55 um, gigs of RAM that I'm going to need, or 6,550 megabytes of RAM that I'm going to need um, to run this particular project. Now, you also typically want to have a place over here to where you can save what these files are. So this might be my structural um, engineer's file. This might be my you know, mechanical. This might be you know, electrical or civil, or these might be my civil so you definitely want to have an ability to say you know, what the files that are attached are, what their sizes are, and then what their multipliers are. Now typically AutoCAD files is really one 
every once in a while we'll get an AutoCAD file that'll have something unique about it that um, requires more than one, a multiplier of one. But the Revit attachments definitely have changed over time. So back when we first did this presentation back in 2008, um, Revit file attachments were also only one. But um, Autodesk has actually been advancing the functionality of Revit files that are attached to a Revit file. So for example, um, you can use the Revit, fi Revit walls that are in a separate Revit project file it's a linked into your current project file as the borders or boundaries for rooms in your current project. So what that means is we're opening up some of the functionality of the linked Revit project into your current project. And the more things like that that you turn on, the higher this particular multiplier gets. So we put in three here as a basic rule for now. Um, I've seen that particular number fluctuate everywhere from one up to around eight or nine whenever all of the functionality of linked files is turned on. So you definitely want to kind of take a look at that. And if you look at this particular project and you load this project up into Revit and you see that, oh, I'm really using more than 6.5, then a lot of times it might be around these particular items. Um, the process of looking at that is pretty simple. Um, you just kind of detach everything and then attach one thing at a time. And then you can see how much RAM that particular item is taking on. Um, another real trick to that, which we'll cover in one of the future um, parts of this particular presentation, is about making sure that all your links are on their own work set. That way you can turn work sets on and off and see how much RAM comes back um, back into your system. And it's a great way to manage RAM on a project. Um, but today we're really just talking about how much RAM does it take. So the rule of 20 is still a great basis to start from, um, but then you also want to figure out the links. And creating a spreadsheet like, the, spreadsheet like this for your office is a really great tool. Um, simple, easy, really simple to do. And like I said, we'll create a, a US CAD version of this um, RAM calculator for Revit, and uh, we'll make that available to people who are watching the presentation or would request it from us. And so it'd be a real easy, simple calculator for you. Moving back into the presentation itself, I'm going to jump back into my PowerPoint and uh, move on to the next stage. So now that we've talked about RAM and how to calculate how much RAM and of all the other topics that we've covered today, I'm hoping that you're asking yourself, you know, how do they know? You know, how do we have this knowledge of what makes Revit work or what makes BIM technology work and how much RAM and, you know, why the processor speeds that we're talking about? So I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about what we do to actually verify this information and how this information is much more objective than a lot of people might think. Um, so basically, we test and we test some more and we test some more and then when we think we're done testing, we test some more. And interestingly enough, the reason that we do so much testing is actually because part of the US CAD uh, family of products or family of brands is actually a brand called BIM9. So BIM9 is actually a concept that we put together back when we worked at Friedmutter Group on how to be able to work on Revit projects from multiple offices and uh, still have performance. So it becomes a discussion about being able to access files remotely, you know, things of that nature. But to figure all of that out for BIM9 and how to build a private BIM cloud, we also had to figure out how the technology actually worked and what performance issues were around the technology. So if you go to www.bim9.com forward slash AUBench, it'll actually take you to a video that we did actually quite a few years ago, but it's an interesting video because it actually shows some interesting pieces. So I'm going to move over to that and I'm going to start playing this and I'm going to jump through it a little bit. But at the very beginning here, I turned the sound off so we don't have to listen to the sound during um, this presentation, but it does have sound to it as well. Um, we took three devices, uh, a MacBook Pro, an HP Mini, which is a, a web book, and also an iPad. And we took a single machine, in this case was an i7 3.2 gigahertz processor machine, and we actually built virtual machines on top of that device. And then we allowed these three devices to access that machine at the same time. And then we ran this scripting tool called AUBench. Um, so AUBench has been around for a little while. And uh, what it does is it runs through a process of running Revit and um, does a number of different things and then gives you a report on how many seconds it took to do each one of those operations. And then you can get a total score of how your machine actually performed um, using Revit um, throughout those operations. So I'm gonna scrub ahead on this just because um, we don't need to see all of that process we went through in detail. And I'm gonna get over here to a point to where 
you can actually see in Revit, you can see a number of different operations going on in each one of these devices. Now again, all three of these machines are actually technically connected to one machine, and that machine is actually doing all the processing power. So one machine has three sessions of Revit running on it simultaneously, and um, we're generating the results. So this is kind of just going through the different motions. Um, we indicate whenever we speed up the video and slow down the video, all that sort of stuff, so you can get a really great understanding of what's happening. And then at the very end, um, we actually come back and actually give you the results of how that um, test went. So this is kind of an interesting piece. So that machine as a workstation, which means no virtual machines on it at all, just that machine by itself um, running Revit scored 230 um, seconds with Revit in this particular test. But then when we ran those three machines on top of it simultaneously, we got 234, 232, and 233. And interestingly enough, what most people are surprised about is the HP Mini ran faster than the other two, um, but it really has to do around the resolution of the screen it was displaying. So the iPad 2 had a higher resolution than the HP Mini, um, so it's just slightly slower. But more importantly, as all of these were running at the same speed, or very close to the same speed, as that machine runs as a workstation. So we had three machines running at once versus it running as a workstation, and we got very similar results. Now, this type of testing is the type of things that we do on a regular basis to determine what things actually make Revit run fast, or um, Navisworks run fast, or any other technology that we're really looking at. So these types of tests are really what give us that information of what really makes them work. And then we also continuously are investigating and looking at new technology and what's coming along. And uh, it's always good to have that information. So again, um, if you go to www.bim9.com forward slash AU bench, um, you can see this particular video. And I'm going to jump back into my PowerPoint again here. And the next thing I really want to talk about is hardware is forever changing. And um, there's actually been some technology out on the market for a little while now that uh, we haven't really jumped on quite yet. And uh, primarily it's because, you know, as hardware comes out, the other vendors that are working on stuff have to kind of get their stuff figured out and what they want to do. So we tend to wait a few months before we get too excited about new hardware. And then whenever we're ready, we really start going in and doing our testing. So I wanted to put a slide into this presentation talking about what's coming next in hardware. And really and truly, the thing that we want to be paying attention to in our world of BIM is around the processor. So Intel is, um, came out here a while back, and there was a code name called Haswell E, um, which is a you know, processor code name that they were using. And uh, that turned into three processors, the i7-5960X, the i7-5930K, and the i7-5820K. And I put a little bit of their specs. I could spend a lot of time talking about all the nuances of what makes these processors super fast. But um, the specs I put on here was just how much cache they have and then what they're up to, what gigahertz. So 3.5, 3.7, 3.6 gigahertz offerings. Um, but the more important part of this, or not, shouldn't say more important, the equally important part of this that matters to us in the world of BIM is that this new processor supports a whole new um, chipset and that allows us to work with DDR4 RAM. Um, and DDR4 RAM is very interesting because it runs on a whole different set of frequencies and it runs a lot faster um, than RAM we've had in the past. So DDR4 um, operates on 1.2 volts, but it runs frequencies between 1600 and 3200. So if you remember earlier, we were talking and I commented that we were running RAM that was 2133 RAM. Um, that frequency, um, this RAM will go all the way up to 3200. And when you're talking about frequencies and megahertz of what RAM is running at, um, slight changes make a massive improvement in how well they perform. And the other key thing to this is the new processor chipset also supports 64 gigs of RAM. So in the past, um, the previous i7 processors before um, this particular chipset you could do 32 gigs of RAM on what I would say would be the lower end or the lower priced um, chips that you would be buying for a workstation for BIM. But to get into 64 gigs of RAM, you had to buy um, a processor and a motherboard that supported a much higher number of cores and was a much more expensive processor. In this particular set of processors, the low end one, in this case, the i7-5820K, um, even though it's the low end and is in that neighborhood of three to four hundred dollars for the processor 
it still supports 64 gigs of RAM. So you can get a workstation all the way up to 64 gigs of RAM with this particular processor. So that's extremely important for us in the world of BIM because RAM, the amount of RAM we can get determines kind of how the biggest projects that we can get. So in the past, we were very limited. So for a while, you could only get 16 gigs of RAM on a machine, and then we were able to get 32 gigs of RAM on a machine, and now we're going to be able to double that again and get 64 gigs of RAM on a machine. And this is super critical because this will really make the difference between what we can move forward with and uh, the size of projects we can work with and the size of hardware related to that. Now, with all that said, I have to state, we're just now getting started into testing this stuff. So I can't really say definitively that all this stuff is going to perform, but it does look very much like the two out of the three parts of the Holy Trinity um, are definitely going to be able to be upgraded. And if they're upgraded and their performance holds out like what we're thinking they're going to hold out, we're going to see a pretty massive improvement overall in what we can do in a workstation environment. And uh, for those of you that follow us with the private BIM cloud concept, um, this is definitely going to improve our overall performance in the private BIM cloud world as well. So with all that said, I wanted to remind everybody that this, of course, was the first part of a three-part series, and uh, we just finished up the hardware and its impact on the BIM performance. And uh, I want to remind everybody that February 11th, we're going to be covering work sets and links. Um, this is a super important part of the process of dealing with some supersized projects and uh, dealing with work sets and understanding how links work and how those relate together. Extremely big part of the process. And then on March 11th, we're going to cover groups and families. And again, understanding exactly how groups work and how families work and how they work together. Um, super important part of the whole process of dealing with supersized projects. Um, so again, I want to thank everybody for coming to Supersize Me. It's been a pleasure doing the presentation for you today. And I want to end up today with just a few comments about USCAD so that you guys have a little bit more knowledge about what USCAD is really about. So we were founded in 1999. Um, we're the largest um, Autodesk reseller or VAR on the West Coast. Um, we have a strong professional services organization with a dedicated team. Um, that's actually my team, so I'm very proud of them. And then we're also experienced in integrating BIM tools and technology into all aspects of your workflow. And I really can't express that enough as we really have spent a lot of energy understanding the integration of technology and business workflow. So that's one of the areas that we really specialize in. The services and solutions that we provide, a number of different areas, some things that people don't always think about. So we do a lot of BIM consulting and implementation. As you learned today, we also know a lot about hardware, um, specifically private BIM clouds and then network infrastructure. Um, a lot of that comes from our BIM 9 um, brand. And then around training, we've done a lot of training for years, but we've really stepped up our training process with something called Knowledge Tracks. And if you haven't looked at that, I highly recommend Knowledge Tracks as a, a way to really create a managed learning environment for your organization. And then something that people, a lot of people don't realize or don't think about is we also have the ability to what we call augment your production capabilities. So if you have a project that is too big and you don't quite have enough staff to deliver on it, or maybe you've lost a sta some staff and you haven't replaced them yet, or maybe you just have a BIM deliverable requirement that you can't quite do, um, we can actually place people um, on site with your folks and work hand in hand with you um, to help deliver on your BIM deliverables. Um, we're not really trying to be a production outsourcing or anything of that nature. It's really about augmenting that team that you already have and helping you get to that next level. Um, we use that service a lot whenever we're doing integration services where we're training people on how to use a BIM technology. And meanwhile, they have a project to deliver. And so our production staff will help them deliver on that project as they're getting educated. And then last but not least, our different locations, our corporate office is in Newport Beach, um, California. We have an office in Los Angeles. We have one in San Diego, Las Vegas, Honolulu, and our most recent addition is Scottsdale, Arizona, or the Phoenix area, um, which we're proud to have them on the team as well. Now for Q&A, um, we did a session of this live and we had some questions and I think we've gathered those questions and answered those questions. Um, but also, if you want to submit more questions, you're welcome to do that. And I'll give you my contact information here shortly. But if you've got more questions, please send them over. We're more than happy to answer them. And then we'll try to distribute those questions to everybody that attended the event, or the live event and the recorded event. So we'll keep a, a running track of everybody that's attended. And then whenever there's a new question and a new answer, um, we'll send that information out to everybody that was part of the event. So. Again, I want to thank everybody for being part of the presentation today. And uh, my name again is Lonnie Compton. That email address is Lonnie, L-O-N-N-I-E dot Compton, C-U-M-P-T-O-N 
at uscad.com. You can also reach me on LinkedIn under Lonnie Compton. And uh, my phone number, this is actually my cell number, so it's 702-241-2999. It is my cell phone, so please practice some professional courtesy. Um, Whenever you're contacting me via cell phone, most questions I would recommend coming through email. Um, It's kind of the normal mode of operation um, for me. So again, thank you everybody for attending, and I hope the presentation gave you some insights and uh, sparked some ideas and thoughts in your mind.